part four of our discussion about geometry today. So this is going to be blending the past few weeks together. We're going to be talking about the purpose of geometry and the subject matter of geometry and how theories get constructed. So simple way to think about it is this. Do you build theories from the bottom up, from establishing the fundamentals and then seeing what logically follows from them to build more advanced structures of knowledge on the fundamentals? Or do you go from the top down? You have some theory that you like, some conclusions that you like, and then if you're interested, you can choose to try to found them on fundamentals or try to find the fundamentals. But if the fundamentals are unclear, it's not a big deal. Believe it or not, this blew my mind when I discovered this just a few years ago, but the approach of modern mathematicians for at least the last, I'd say, three centuries is top down. It's not bottom up. Ironically enough, Euclid had the bottom up approach, axiomatic deductive theory. I think that's the correct, uh, the correct way to go about building a theory. I just think he got the axioms wrong. But the modern approach is to say, look at what we can do with calculus. Look at what we can do with geometry, Euclidean geometry. Look how well it works. Who cares about the underlying philosophy and fundamentals of it? It works and that should be good enough. I believe this is a completely wrong method for constructing theories of any sort. My favorite analogy is the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. Now, the Ptolemaic model of the solar system was where the Earth was in the center of the solar system, everything revolved around the Earth. And if you look at a map of the Ptolemaic model, it's beautiful. You've got the Earth in the center and you've got all of the heavenly bodies orbiting around it. And then on the orbits of those heavenly bodies, you have these little little squiggles that kind of reverse and then they go in their direction. Those are called epicycles. The reason for the epicycles is because the predictions didn't quite work of the geocentric model and so they had to add little additions, little epicycles here and there to try to get their predictions to fit the theory. Now I bring that up because the Ptolemaic model of the solar system worked and it worked incredibly well. In fact for a long period of time it worked better than a heliocentric model of the solar system, a sun, the, the theory that everything revolves around the sun. So those who are arguing, methodologically speaking, that the end conclusions are more important than the fundamentals are mistaken, I would say, in that circumstance. They're dogmatic and mistaken. The person that sees little problems with that dominant theory and can craft a new theory based on different, completely different fundamentals I think is a more careful thinker. I think that is the way that progress gets made in terms of our theoretical constructions. Now, importing this back into geometry and mathematics, Euclidean geometry works extraordinarily well. What is the reason for that? Is it the case that because Euclidean geometry works, it must be a true theory? No, that's not true as exemplified by the Ptolemaic model of the solar system. Predictions worked, and yet it was completely fundamentally wrong. So it's possible that Euclidean geometry works, and calculus, let's say, works, but for the wrong reasons. Not for the reasons that mathematicians and geometers think that they work. My approach specifically to geometry is like this. In order to create a coherent theory of the taking up of space, which is what I say geometry is about, I am positing the existence of a three-dimensional unit if we're talking about physical space. If we're talking about 2D space, a two-dimensional unit. All of the, the space that I'm describing can be reducible to those fundamental units, those base units that I call them. So in my theory, space like this is composite space. It's a bunch of little things put together. This is like an atomic geometric way of thinking about how space works. There's a bunch of base units that are indivisible. You put them together and then you get extended space. If you take that approach, you get no irrational numbers. You get no infinities, zero infinities. You get all of the predictive power of mathematics. You just understand things a little bit different. So uh, for example, the Pythagorean theorem works if you have a huge amount of base units. So what is a di what does it mean to say a diagonal line in terms of this theory? Well, a diagonal line is a composite object made of a bunch of units. And so you can approximate the truth about distance between two points 
by using the Pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c, c squared. It's not going to be perfectly precise, but that's because a perfectly precise triangle cannot be coherently constructed. Now, I freely admit, if my alternative theory didn't have the kind of explanatory power of Euclidean geometry, it would be a much bigger stretch to be proposing that this is a superior way of thinking about geometry. But actually, when you work through the logic of it, it does give you the same predictive power. And in fact, it explains what you're looking at right now, which is a video on a computer screen that is a composite amount of space built up of a finite amount of pixels. You think you see perfect curves, you think you see circles, you think you see squares on your computer screen, but by the Euclidean standard, you actually don't. All you're seeing is a bunch of tiny little squares that are arranged in a particular way that gives your consciousness the illusion of some perfect smoothness or perfect continuity. So my claim in approaching mathematics is as follows. If your composite object cannot be constructed out of a finite number of base units, that object does not and cannot exist because shapes are composite objects. The Euclidean approach is to say, we're going to start with the concept of a perfect triangle. And that perfect triangle, what well, doesn't quite fit with the idea of being base unit, therefore everything's infinitely divisible. And it's made up of a finite number of points and lines, but the line, points take up no space, zero dimensional lines take up one dimension. And it's not exactly clear how the infinities work together, and it's not exactly clear what irrational numbers mean, unless we're saying that numbers exist separate of our mind. But we like the idea of talking about perfect triangles and perfect circles, so we're just going to go with it. Two very fundamentally different approaches to thinking about the philosophy of mathematics. And unfortunately, there's not enough discussion about these ideas taking place. People, mathematicians in particular and intellectuals, put mathematics at, on a pedestal. They say there's no way that these mathematical ideas, the Pythagorean theorem, could possibly be wrong, and therefore we're going to use it as a metric to determine the intelligence of other people. If they disagree with this certainly true claim, they must not be intelligent, and therefore we can't entertain their theories. This, I am claiming, explicitly is dogmatic. It's no less dogmatic than a group of powerful theologians in the church getting together and saying, the litmus test for whether or not we're going to treat your ideas seriously is whether or not you accept the self-evident fact of the existence of God. If you don't, you're a heretic and we're not going to listen to you. The same thing is going on in mathemat mathematics and it ain't just geometry. It's shot throughout, especially modern mathematics. Arithmetic's probably fine, <laughs> but higher levels of math, I think far too commonly are assumed being immune from skepticism and so people don't even look. If they were to look, they would see what I've seen, which is a bunch of dubious metaphysical claims that just aren't challenged.